Hello, and welcome to another episode of Conscious Leaders, the podcast, where I speak with leaders and their advisors about the world of work. Today is an extra special episode and a little bit different from the guests that I normally have. So today I'm speaking with Julia Buena, who is a psychotherapist, and she specializes in um, the inner critic. She's an author. She's just written her second book, which is called Everybody's a Critic. And this is so relevant for anyone out there that has ever experienced imposter syndrome, for anyone out there that recognizes that little voice in their head that isn't necessarily always positive. Very often it's a little bit um, critical without compassion. Um, This is a great episode to listen to. And as I say in our chat, I was updating her on, you know, when I went back to work, I actually remember having a coach who said, you know, what's that voice in your head? What's the voice say to you? And I had no idea about the voice. I didn't even know it was there. And ultimately I have realized what my inner critic is saying to me and what she does, how she might try to sabotage me sometimes. Um, And the first step really is awareness. Um, So I hope you enjoy this episode. We talk about what the inner critic is, inner critic versus self-critic. And yes, there's a difference, but um, there's blurred lines. Uh, We talk about awareness, mindfulness. We talk about um, the ways to tame the inner critic and also some, we just have a nice general conversation. We're very aligned. Jules and I are aligned. Um, So here we go over to the episode with Julia Bueno. Enjoy. Welcome, Julia. As I know you, Jules, welcome to Conscious Leaders. Thank you so much for being part of this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with your journey your journey to psychotherapy and to your special day. So if you can give us a little bit of a background, it would be great. Sure. Well, actually, um, my journey was is to psychotherapy is probably, I don't know, it's completely unusual, but maybe not predictable in that I started my professional career as a lawyer. I um, studied law academically, flirted with academic law before training as a solicitor, but um, I sort of gave myself the red card before, I think, the law firm was going to give me one. It, we were not a meeting of minds or cultures. I found I, I ended up in an area of law where I was sort of doing tax planning for very high net worth individuals. And I, I found myself less and less interested in, in the numbers and the drafting and more and more interested in their stories and their life stories and kind of family dynamics. So that sort of sowed a seed. Um, and long story short, I, um, I, I left law and sort of tried a bit of this and that before settling in uh, my retraining as a psychotherapist, um, which is what I do now. Uh, so I've been practicing psychotherapy for, for 20 years, um, the last half of which pretty much solely in private practice, having worked in the NHS and various other organizations before that. Um, and uh one area of specialty I have is around uh, pregnancy loss and infertility, which led me to write my first book, The Brink of Being, and after which I was sort of left um, quite uh, interested to write another book and quite relieved that I actually did manage to publish a book that, that uh, strong sentence together. It gave me, boosted my confidence, talking about we're going to come on to self-criticism, but indeed, you know, that's something that has been a cross that I've I've had to bear over my life and my my therapy um and in fact it was a friend of mine who said you know what are you going to write about next and I said well I I don't know and she said well what's the next best thing you you know about apart from pregnancy loss and immediately the answer was self-criticism so that that's what led me to write my second book which is called everyone's critic um and exploring this sort of universal habit um I mean I'll I'll be interested to hear what you say Gret but but whenever I mention this book or, or the, the theme of which I'm interested in, pretty much everyone says, oh, yeah, I've got one of them. Mm. Yeah, definitely my own worst critic. And recently I found myself saying that to myself 
a lot more frequently for some reason, like just, or just it's the awareness. Now I'm so, aware that I might okay. be criticizing myself. Well, that's the first step. You know, if we're going to work with it, um, be curious about it and, and try and wriggle away from its pause. We can't do that, as you well know, unless we have that awareness in the first place. Yeah. Um, so bringing a bit of mindfulness into your being without necessarily even knowing you're doing mindfulness. Well, it, it, exactly. I mean, I, I think um, there are plenty of people who come to me in the room kind of aware that they're sabotaging their lives, aware that they can, they might use language like, you know, I lack confidence or I lack self-worth or, you know, I think I'm, I've got imposter syndrome or I think I'm a bit rubbish or they, they you know, might, they might have that level of awareness, but, but quite often I'm talking to people who, as you say, this, that, that's screened out, they're, they're, they're feeling distress and misery and it's that it needs to be pointed out to them well hang on a minute there's a sort of extra layer you're bringing to your distress here that that lack of insight um kind of gets a what we can call you know a double whammy effect yeah um I'm just thinking about well, I went back to work after my second son was born and I was promoted into a big VP role where I was managing a big team I definitely had imposter sy syndrome was like oh my god I now have to manage my peers and I had a coach who said, what is it that you say to yourself? And I really had no idea what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, what? What mm -hmm. am I saying to myself? And then I really started thinking about it. I tried to pay attention to it. And mm -hmm. I got to a point where I realized that like, and I don't know if this is the inner critic or it's the story or if they're the same thing, but that I just didn't think I was good enough for anything. And that mm -hmm. was so deeply rooted for so right. long. I really didn't know that that's yeah. what was deep dark. So is that the inner critic or is that just a story that I told myself? Well, I would say, aren't the two the same? I mean, if I want to be really technical here and I'm not, I'm not bothered by this at all, but in the literature, you might find that an inner critic is actually something slightly different from a self-critic. So okay. um, a self-critic is, is, and as I say, the lines are very blurred and I don't want to hang, get too hung up about it, but for example, I know I've got a voice in my head that is the voice of one of a, a boss I had early on in my career who was not just by my reckoning, by everyone's reckoning. In fact, I, I still meet people today who came across his path, who who was, um, I mean, it sounds a bit much to say, but he, he had pathic tendencies. He was a very deeply unpleasant man and he, he was a bully and he shouted at me. And still to this day, 25 years later, I can kind of wince and hear his voice in my head shouting at me. Now, that's not self-criticism. That's an inner critic. You know, I've internalized him that I, when it happens, I know it's not me. It's just a memory of him going, oh, so, so self-criticism is much more an internal dynamic. It's when you're turning in against yourself. But of course, as I say, it's very blurred because if we've had enough external criticisms, that's where it comes from. We internalize and, and it becomes our own. We come to believe it. But Going back to your story about your coach, you know, that's a really good example of, of her sort of shining a light on something. And, and that I imagine being incredibly useful um, because that's where we start. And I, I, in my clinical experience, it's very rare to meet somebody who, you know, insight lights the whole way. They, they get that, oh God, what? I'm doing this to myself. I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um, it's incredibly rare, it's that powerful. And I can, you know, as I say, I can think of one or two people where they've actually, through journaling just looked at the pages go what am I doing but for the vast majority of us that that, that awareness is the first stage it's you know there thereafter begins the tough the tougher work of dismantling it and and actually you know wriggling away from from the the, the thrust of the content of what it says because it's well and easy to say well, I'm not going to talk to myself in that way but if you're really believing it if those sort of saturated with this belief that you're not you're you're less good than or not good enough or a bit rubbish at this um it's a it's it's a bit more work to be done so before we get into sort of the steps yeah, of sure. we, how we work through it um where does it come from so you've talked about your boss that that's something they that said but for example mine it did mine is a story and i've obviously mm. said it to myself but it must have come from somewhere. And I, I mean, parents are, and I, I came from like a loving family that my parents were always. Yeah. So why did I turn out this way versus, you know, or why do I say this to myself versus my siblings who don't? 
Good question. And the answer to that is obviously very idiosyncratic because we are all we all have different life experiences. Plus, we all have, I believe, you know, different personalities, nature and nurture. So you might be a you know much more sensitive person than the ne- the rest. So you might sort of take on messaging more than the rest. But I start on the basis, and I write about this in my book, that you know I don't believe. Um, although there has, I have had an argument with a, not an argument, a conversation with an astrologer who, who really challenged me on this, but that I don't believe a baby is born into the world thinking, oh God, my, my thighs are a bit fat or oh, my, my <laughs> whale is a bit whaley. Um, you know, we're, we're born into the world, little, you know, complicated things, but without that kind of level of self-judgment. So we, 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 over the years, internalize lots of messaging. And in my, you know, my book is an attempt through storytelling and through kind of fictionalized clients to um, unpack some of the very common influences that I talk about. And of course, there are many that lead people to to become self-critical I, b- before that, the, before going into the sort of storytelling and the possible probable life experiences. It's worth mentioning that um, I'm sure you know this, that, you know, our brains are wired through kind of evolutionary biology to be uh to tilt towards negativity we have lots of negative negative biases that keeps us safe you know much we wouldn't be here today if we walked through the wood at night and heard a crack and thought oh that's jane coming to play poo sticks you know we'd be toast so um so it's, uh, th- there is that with that negativity bias, that kind of um and and also the, the desire to keep our caregivers near us. There's there's some sort of hard wiring in our brains that tilt us towards negative self criticism. That it's e- so. For example, when we're little, um, it, it's it's much safer and easier to blame ourselves if our caregiver is letting us down. To say oh it must be my fault rather than mum or dad because um we need we need to keep mum and dad safe we're not gonna we're not gonna cancel them and walk away with they need to feed us and water us and all of that so that's played out really intensely with some trauma bonding but anyway that's a big digression so first off we've got this sort of neurobiology but then of course you you've mentioned parents and yes one of my stories in my book is um around uh, uh parents who um very much contributed in that uh, environment to self-criticism. In this particular case, I've got a story of a young girl whose father was very academically um, ambitious and pressured his daughter very well to do. You know, so she, she learned at a very early age to, to that her self-worth uh, played through getting A stars and gold medals and coming first in the running race and all of that. Um, and, a, and a very an emotionally absent mother who, who didn't sort of antidote that. And through her absence and lack of praise, there wasn't enough sort of ant- shoring that up. So, I, I mean, of course, there are lots of, uh, you can have a quite egregious parenting where you're, where kids are actively exposed to cr- criticisms. And I've certainly heard some very sad stories along the way of you know, parents uh, being very explicit about their, um their their kids lack of worth quote unquote so parents and siblings are are very powerful influences but I also talk about in my stories the power of um internalized racism and and sexism and bullying and homophobia and I'm thinking uh, I also have a story about a couple who this is a sort of as I said before a particular area of expertise for me but a couple who really um struggle to conceive and and carry a baby to term and uh their sense of failure through through not being parents we live in a very pronatal society um i've got another story of a, a woman who comes to me in slightly older age and is and is like we said before completely unaware of her self-criticism but it turns out that actually she came from incredibly orthodox christian um fam- i mean i i anonymize it but it's a, it's a, a very um uh yeah orthodox christian community where you know the 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 men it's very patriarchal and and women were and very strict and very very strict and so she internalized a very strict divine you know god who um even thinking about herself was sinful so it's no wonder she 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 was sort of too terrified to have any insight because she intrinsically felt it to be a very kind of selfish sinful thing so there you go. I've just given you a sort of smorgasbord of stories. But the point, the point, I suppose, in that is that 
you know, there could be lots of reasons why everyone's journey is idiosyncratic. And quite often, it's not usually just one thing. Sometimes it's an obvious one thing. You know, I was savagely bullied for 10 years by my sibling who told me I was ugly and stupid and whatever. Or it can just be a constellation of stuff. Um, and I think, you know, I'm sure you do this a lot in your work, that there's so much that is unconscious that 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 we take on, especially as, as women um, and people of colour who have who have just, you know, it's the water they swim in. And it's that, that on some level they've swallowed a hole that they're not good enough. Um, so, yeah, the story can be of varying lengths. Yeah. Um, is the inner critic all bad? You know, or is it something that, you know, we all we all have an inner critic and we need to sort of figure out how to work with it in a positive way? Yes. I mean, I agree with you. No, I don't think it is all bad. I think it's I think it's appropriate that we do have guilt and an inner criticism, you know, guilt as opposed to shame um, and 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 healthy criticism as opposed to self-recrimination, sort of self-sabotaging. You know, where do you draw the line? That, that again is is takes some discernment but and and our own kind of wisdom but of course it, you know it helps to to have some measure of self-correction when we cock up um and and that we learn from but, but I guess the idea about this this work that we're both in is is um l learning from our mistakes in a in a, a, a way that's kind of helpful rather than pushing us down the rabbit hole and disconnecting us and being bathed in shame and I'm such a terrible person. One way to make it a bit more concrete, I suppose, for me, I think is thinking about the the, the metaphor of, of, of or was it an analogy, <laughs> of um, teachers, you know, you've got young kids and what kind of teacher do you want for them? Do you want the kind of warm, um, good job, you know, two out, two plus two isn't five. That isn't right, but nearly. You know, as opposed to the, you know, yeah. stay behind. You're going to do a hundred lines. Which, unfortunately, you know, I'm old enough to have had schooling. I definitely experienced the both, and I know which school, I, which class I thrived in. So it's interesting you say that because, well, I we have a seven year old and a ten year old, but um, my husband, who you know, um, was like, is he ever going to get corrected on these spelling ah. mistakes? Right. And I was like, I know it's, but we're, we're, we're going in the positive, like, well, we're noticing the, the good things, the teachers noticing, encouraging the good things and not necessarily at this point for the seven-year-old in particular, pointing out where the mistakes are, because it is, it is a school that encourages, encourages over whips the lip, whips the lip, lash, whatever. Yes. <laughs> whatever that statement is. But he, he, because he comes from a stricter schooling background where he, you know, was educated in a certain way I think he was like when are they going to correct him like when is it right to correct yeah I mean and and you know I don't want to kind of drift into the realms of parenting yeah. is a is a it, it is a, it, an idiosyncratic uh, path it's no I've got no right to tell you how to parent but 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 I you know going back to the original question is inner criticism ever a good thing I personally think yes you know we we do we we live in a society and we we don't all want to be narcissists do we so um but the the trick is you know where as you say where do you draw the line and when do you you know what is that wisdom and what is that discernment and I think as a very general rule we're in a better place to to answer those questions if we're feeling kind of steadier on the ground if we do turn the heat down on a kind of really frosty in a climate when we're at war with ourselves we can get that back on track I think we're far better equipped to then be discerning about when you need to tick yourself off and when you don't you know I I, I this is interesting because um you know lots of people I talk to about this work are terrified to let go of their self-critic because they think it's binary if I let go I'm going to become a narcissist I'm going to become selfish I don't want to be this person um and you know I, I don't think it works that way and you know need, there's some reassurance around that that people hold well, on to it very tightly yeah and I guess also the inner critic was there at some point to protect you quite yes exactly I mean quite often it's it, it, it yeah more often than not it was it, it's a defensive maneuver we created it to keep ourselves psychologically and emotionally safe yes and letting go of that can feel very frightening and also we it 
alongside that is that it tricks us. It, we begin to believe because we we sort of fuse this notion of um, productivity and success with. Um, yeah, we think, well, if I don't do that, then I'm going to start failing. Um, but oh. yes, it's a re-education there. What about the connection? Like, how is the inner critic connected, linked to our ego? Is there a link? Say more what you mean by that? Just like our ego, that does, is our ego in any way um, linked to the inner critic? Is it enhanced by the inner critic or does, does the ego play into the inner critic in any way? Or are they totally separate things? Well, I can, I mean, to use that language, uh, uh, you know, uh, a critic is, uh, is our super ego. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, okay. It's, it's the one that's, that's going to grab the steering wheel and says you're going to go in that direction. And, and as I said before, if there's, there's, a, if there's a, an early fusion between our sense of kind of self and the world with, um, with a sort of striving for perfection and I'm not quite good enough and I've got to keep working hard, yes, it can become a very fused thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so awareness is key. As the That's where you start. Step. Where and you so, start. you know, some people are obviously more aware than others. What do you do when, how do you work with clients that are really aren't, they aren't self-aware? They don't even know this is happening. So what would be your first steps to help them become more aware? Well, I might be the kind of um, literally the, the awareness for them. You know, I might literally sit there in the room and say, hang on a minute. Can you just, just repeat what you just said out loud? Whoa. Do you, do you, do you speak like that to your partner, to your child, to your best friend? Answer always no I might get somebody to as I say kind of journal um I just want you to you know either kind of set up some experiment either kind of formally or you know you're going to go to a triggering environment and just sit down and write that out and maybe they'll bring the journal in um what's also before I forget I think it's really important you you mentioned this that your coach sort of provoked you to start tuning in to what you were saying to yourself not everybody hears you know recognizes words i i don't i don't my my inner self-critic is far more kind of felt sense of of ugh and kind of internal attack rather than words but either way really fleshing that out is important just tuning into if you if you do recognize words how do you say it and what's the tone of voice oh. and so that you you know you really get a full picture of what it, that that helps beef up the awareness so you yeah. you can as I, as I say, sort of learn to um, do something other with it. I've also had people say, you know, like, close your eyes and des describe it. Like, what color is it? Mm -hmm. Where are you feeling it? Are those? Yeah, I mean, that relevant. Uh, it for could some? be. It could be. I mean, it depends on some people might kind of run out the room if I say that. That would freak them out. But if you're, it, some people are very visual and they absolutely, and it helps to work, you know, with with that if to 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 um beef up the kind of observer mindful position to to personify it in some ways and yes i can think of people who do have very clear kind of imagery around it or or even a felt sense in their body they might sort of have a tight ball in their chest or their belly or somewhere else but but yes just um anything that helps to kind of get some mastery out you know the, the idea about writing about it is inherently you're sort of taking control and you're writing about it you're beefing up that that healthier bit um but um yeah sometimes that can take a bit of time because if it's been if you've spent three four decades on the planet um i mean it reminds me of that um your american is it david foster wallace he that famous story of him talking about the, the fish in the water Yes. Yeah. 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 And the, the you know, night, are you join the swim boys and they're saying, well, you know, don't, didn't you like the water boys? And they go, what, what's the water? These fish are not aware they're swimming in the water. So for veteran self-critics, it can be the same. They're not aware of the water. Um, OK, so once they have awareness, yes. what, what is the next step? Well, the, the way that I work is the next step is is to foster a curiosity about this not going in there hell for leather oh god i've got this bloody inner critic now i can see it and it's sabotaging my life and it's really annoying and uh, going into resistance and fight is just going to backfire and actually it's um paradoxically introducing another critic isn't it 
you're criticizing yourself critic so <sighs> we're back we're back to square one and it's really common for people to to do that because it it can be the you know the a massive stumbling block in their lives so from the off just encouraging some com you know, compassion and curiosity or a compassionate curiosity to combine the two about it so let's think about this where did this come from going back to where we started I don't believe you came into the world thinking you weren't good enough so so why and where and when did you did you take these messages in so that's the story making and that's that's the stuff of of sessions you know whether it's one two three 50 sessions of of and sometimes it might take time because if it's a particularly shameful story if it's a piece that's really really painful um you know that has to be done tenderly but um over the course of however long it takes i think it, it for the most people it really helps to oh okay that's why i do it it's not so it becomes less ideally if all goes well it becomes, you know, I am, to coin a phrase, you know, I, I'm not good enough, becomes less of a truth, sort of swallowed whole, felt to be in every cell of the body to be true, a fact, to more of a, ah, this is a belief, not a truth. And I've, I work, I'm beginning to work out why it makes sense that I do. And I, and I understand why I internalize this. I'm not berating myself. I understand. I was a, little boy little girl doing my best of making sense of the world so that tends to be the kind of longer piece of work of um making sense of it and then and then if all goes well we can recruit all that understanding that we have and hopefully and this is a really difficult bit for the vast majority of my of my really self-critical clients the kind of compassion and kindness and understanding for that to to be able to you know to recruit all that to to help us um disengage from those beliefs from you know when they pop up just go ah, you know i see you i hear you understand you but here's your p45 or whatever metaphor works um yeah but... it's like the awareness and the acceptance and then you go back to almost awareness that it's that it's there you have to keep being aware that oh it's popping up again to then switch it off or move it away or or yeah or move away from it get more space around it we can't yeah. it is a part of us we've got to accept the fact that we you know it's it's embedded in experience and and stuff that has happened and we can't erase it or put it out with tweezers or any of that and yes, it's going back to the awareness, but as I said, kind of the, the I think the emphasis on on this and it is uh, really keeping an eye on your internal climate of of kindness and compassion and understanding towards a self critic. The game is over if we, as I said, going back, if we introduce any note of frustration or pissed offness or um, yeah, sort of at attack at it because um as you, you you flagged up it was a defensive maneuver in the first place and we were doing our best and and a lot of times you know there there is some stories that really deserve a lot of compassion and a lot of people find that really difficult they would find it really easy to throw their arms around a child they know who is being having a tough time and of course you know i give them time but giving themselves time or giving themselves the same compassion is can often be really challenging and and sort of counterintuitive and I'm kind of putting a face because it can you can really flinch no I get that because I for a long time I was like I couldn't be kind to myself I'm just wondering how for those people that you work with how do you mm. help them get to a place of compassion if it's not natural for them gosh <laughs> sometimes uh it takes time it can take it, it, it you know it's not an overnight thing like you don't uh, rebuilding your relationship with yourself can take as long as it takes to build a relationship with another human being. I mean, I don't make a best friend in one hour a week. Um, so, but having said that, you know, some people might want to kind of help themselves along by being really conscious of this work and maybe building in self-compassion practices, for example. In my book, uh, at the end, in the epilogue, there's I, I've got a kind of mini bibliography of references of 
of lots of sort of supporting literature and self-help practices and you've mentioned mindfulness but the work of Kristen Neff is somebody that I've Amazing. been a big fan of and, and you know she, she, I've been I've done training with her and so um, you know she her work as you know rests on kind of mindfulness principles and I think mindfulness is extremely supportive of, the, of, of therapy full stop um, at the very least because it, it well there's lots of reasons why I really like it, but but being able to kind of skill us up to to have that observer position and to have that able that ability to be aware and to realise. So so if so, what am I saying is that um, you know therapy is not the holy grail, <laughs> um, but uh, alongside that there are there are lots of practices that we can do to to help ourselves and and, and reading and literature as well. Um, but it, it, it's an it's a commitment. You know, in the same that any other relationship, a healthy relationship is a commitment. We don't, you know, friendships and partnerships and parent and kids, they all thrive through, you know, actively committing to each other, don't they? So it's the same with ourselves. And it, it, it it's not, it, it, I'm just banging on a bit, I know now, but it's sometimes I take a bit of a switch. It's not just about showing up at therapy or booking in a yoga course or drinking kale smoothie for breakfast. All the things are great, you know, not knocking them. It's, but it's, what's much more important is the, is what goes on deep down inside of you moment to moment um, and paying attention to that and pay and throwing all your energy on, on that. I'd much rather you eat McDonald's and concentrate on that. Yeah, totally. And actually, well, you know, I'm a yoga teacher and I love yoga. It right. works for, it works for, it's a practice that works for me and I love sharing it with others, but it's not necessarily for everyone. I'm also a meditator. It's, it's, it's been hugely beneficial for me. Um, but everyone needs to start with what works for them or figure out what works for them. And that's going to be unique for each of us. Exactly. And I'm sure, I mean, I'd be interested if, as a yoga teacher. I, I, my wild guess is that you have people in your class who still say oh I'm rubbish at yoga I can't oh, do totally problem. yeah and I have Which, a lot of people that say I don't do yoga because I'm not flexible yeah I'm like well come to my class it's not about flexibility it's about power well, <laughs> exactly it's 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 missing the point entirely isn't it yeah no so, and I'm like it's not about flexible body it's actually about flexible mind and I always bring awareness into it like yeah. Yeah, this is not about perfection at all. It's simply like, yeah. where's your mind going when you're going into that posture? Are you giving yourself a hard time about wobbling in a standing pose? Or are you, yeah. you know, oh, this is what's happening right now. I'm yeah. falling out of my balance. Yeah, What's happening today? Why am I falling out of my balance? Because actually that falling out of your balance is indication of something else that might be happening out, off the mat. Yeah, and it's, it sounds like exactly what I do. It's it's fostering a, a compassionate curiosity. I and like to call it playful, playful curiosity. Okay. But yes. it's sort of the, it's the same idea. It is. It is, because there's a spaciousness around it. We're not going in with any kind of judgment. It's, you know, and that's how we are with our kids, aren't we? When we, we instinctively um, have that kind of openness and play. Well, kids are so good at it anyway, but with each other. But um but when it, yeah, we, we somehow do a, a U-turn when it comes to ourselves. So yeah. well, um, that's, you, that's an anchor I keep coming back to yeah. always. And maybe you do, do you too. Do you find that people more and more, or maybe it's been the same for, for the length of time that you've practiced, that it's, it's like this resistance to self-care or to get, because it feels a little bit greedy to, to have therapy or to do something that's going to support them, they thinking it's it's actually just for me, whereas actually it benefits, in my opinion, when I work on myself, it benefits everyone else around me. But absolutely no doubt about that. I mean, that's if you want to do a PR job on on self um, compassion, I would say that, uh, and people really worry about going back. You know, that oh, I'm going to become narcissistic and selfish. You know, quite the opposite. When we're steeped in self criticism, it's really disconnecting yeah. and disabling. We can't you know, th thrive in community and, um, but um, do what, well, go, sorry, I didn't answer I was just saying, if, have you seen a, a, a different, in the length of time that you've practiced, has there been any fluctuation between, um, yeah, have there been a difference in how people um, support themselves and are, do people now more, are they more, do they have more of a tendency to 
try new things to support themselves or do they think it's sort of, oh, that's like, I can't do that. That's sort of pampering and that's. Well, yes and no, because you've just reminded me of something super important that I forgot to mention before about these influences. One of which is I have noticed more, more and more people coming to therapy. 20 years ago when I started, people would come in secret. You know, they were paying me in cash because they didn't want the joint account to, to, you know, show that they were coming. Whereas now, you know, I have people on the doorstep. So I've got to go. I met my therapist, you know, that it's it's much more quotidian. So there is there is that. I'm also seeing far younger people than I ever did. When I started out, I wouldn't see anybody. Might have been a reflection of my own age, but I'm I'm impressed and I suppose saddened by uh younger and younger very young adults coming to find me I mean that's a, it's a good thing but it's also I think a state of the world thing which is very sad but what am I also the, but the other thing that you reminded me of saying that is the influence of um social media and online life that, and that I wanted having, to ask you about yeah, yeah I mean that that has had a major major contributory effect to, to mental health there's no doubt about it it comes in the room you know I have smartphones taken out in the room all the time to show me xyz or whatever and um and that I also it in one of my case studies in my book is is uh I mean she's not an influencer but she's somebody who has a very kind of prolific online life and how you know that is played out um in terms of of her own self worth, but also also just the availability of information that you know you you can be exposed to betrayals and hurt hurt information so much more readily than in my day. I'm just so grateful I never had social media growing up, but that that's. Um, but then our children, we think, oh gosh, how, you well know. we're parents and we can do something about that. But yeah. we can talk um, about talk about the how how to do that offline. <laughs> <laughs> Quite boundaries yeah digital yeah. boundaries but yeah. um but but so so yes i think there's i i think there is a raised consciousness definitely of of what we call self-care and what to do but with a note of caution and i write about this in my in my book i think that i have a a, a, a what i would like to describe as sort of healthy skepticism or just just a kind of cautiousness around the the self-care slash well-being industry because um I worry that it becomes a little bit too individualistic and you know going back a few steps what we both agree on is that pro proper she says in quotes that the self-care that I'm plugged into and that I'm keen on is all about um community and relationships and keeping us plugged in um, but also the other kind of thing I notice is that it kind of backfires because I talk to, to younger people who come in the room and go, you know, I'm doing my yoga, I'm doing my meditation, I'm doing a restrictive fasting or whatever, and I'm still not fixed. Why? I'm so rubbish at this. Yeah. So it's sort of setting the bar kind of really high, um, I'm, you know, through the distorted nature of all these and I'm not I, I don't even know the nth of it because I'm deliberately not on Facebook or Twitter or I mean I'm on Instagram and that's about all I can cope with and so I'm not the best person to, I've never been on TikTok in my life so I only I can only guess uh, what sort of messaging is out there and how distorting it is. For those people that come in and say I'm doing all these things I I can understand that because you think oh I'm doing all these things to benefit myself but it's still not helping. And I've been through this because I all of a sudden realized at a certain point, I was like, I'm doing these things, but I'm actually not really invested in them. I'm doing them as a tick. As a token, than, yeah. Exactly. So, oh, tick, I did it. I did it. So surely I'm going to be okay today. When actually then I've taken a step, I've cut things out and just focus on things that actually, this is like meditation now, that's my non-negotiable in the morning. I used to yeah. have to exercise and meditate and da, da, da. And that's overwhelming to put that yeah. pressure on me, especially to then want to be able to connect with my children and yeah. have that time. So now I've dialed it back. I'm like, okay, if there's one thing I do. Yeah. It's meditate, and I, I make sure I have time for that because that does really set, set yeah. myself up for the day. And I actively invest in that one thing rather than all. Well, I think that's very wise. And that's another thing I hope to help people do is to, I mean, it goes also goes back to this idea of, you know, I'd much rather it's somebody at McDonald's as long as they're doing that 
kind of internal work if we we can get so caught up frantically searching for solutions looking outwards looking for the kind of externals when it's it it's inter- none of that it's like throwing jelly at the wall um it's only going to stick if you if you just stop and pause and and really dig deep and and mm. tune into what's going on inside um yeah you 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 could carry on filling your day with with self-improvement but left your own devices those quiet moments when you're not doing something if you're still still where you started um then what i'm sure you'd i'm sure you'd agree with me like ultimately we do have the answers inside of us if we allow ourselves the time to sort of be still or sit with someone to to try to talk it out however you get there but ultimately like we do know what we need sometimes we need a little bit of guidance over to one direction I do agree with you I really and that and that's part of my many jobs as a therapy therapy uh, being a therapist is a is a wonderful and curious thing because I think there are many jobs that we we do in the room but absolutely one of them is um helping someone find their own wisdom and I deal with a lot of people who come sort of really believing that they they have no idea you know they're lost they don't know what they want they don't know who they are and um well i believe i believe them i don't i don't believe it to be tr- i believe them what they i believe what they're saying and i believe they feel that to be true but i don't believe it to be true absolutely so um some of the work is you know if people just slow down and stop dizzying themselves with what tiktok has to offer <laughs> um and learn to 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 be with themselves and and yeah become tune in and become aware of their internal climate mm. then that's a you know really good place to start i think getting them getting people on those rails yeah yeah i totally agree can i just ask um yes, so we yes. work with a lot of businesses and business leaders and their team i'm just wondering your um do you do work with do you work with business leaders or owners or people that have full on jobs and have started to recognize their inner critic. Yes, I mean, I, I I do. They come into my practice. I mean, I wouldn't work with them in an organizational context. You know, I'm yeah. not kind of coached that way. But they might well come to me. I mean, maybe this is a digression, but I suppose I work with a lot more women than men, um, yeah. and that's just maybe because I'm a female therapist. And but also we know the data shows that a lot more women show up in therapy than men. Um, like my yoga practice. Like right. My classes. <laughs> right. And the, the the women in leadership roles who come to me might be suffering the kind of quite common female uh, version of self-criticism, which is imposter syndrome. Um, but also, and then this might be the digression bit, is that the the women in leadership roles that I speak to tend to be at a stage in their life where they've got a lot on they're not only got full-on jobs but they have maybe teenage kids or kids about to leave home their parents are getting a bit older um their bodies are changing maybe they're in perimenopause or you know just that the odd hip is going to hurt or the frozen shoulder you know our bodies give begin to creak don't they so that they have a really really full plate and winding back a bit you know despite being 2023 uh we still are up against uh sexism in the workplace and racism in the workplace and all of that so when i work with and leaders, ageism now too and, and age- ageism mm. and ageism yeah exactly um i suppose i'm talking to uh, yes and i'm now immediately thinking of those women who have lost their jobs and are in the trying yeah. to, to yeah to, to recalibrate so um yeah and and sometimes sometimes that work is around kind of permission giving like you know there is I, I I do think that women have not all but a lot of us have swallowed from the very very early age this idea of of um sucking it up you know we we have been schooled from the very beginning to oh yeah periods hurt you know just take some neurofen yeah child both hurts you know just have an epidural it'll be fine so you know on on that that just speaks of a much kind of bigger piece of of um of yeah women women suffering 
I think un, sometimes unduly unnecessary for too long. So so sometimes it's kind of permission giving, giving, telling a very high, high achieving successful woman, you know, it's OK to fray at the age edges. You are not a huge superhuman. Um, it's interesting because I well, so when I do presentations for teams, <clears throat> I talk about my burnout and I'm just like, this is what I went through. And it's very matter of fact, like I don't mm. feel ashamed of saying what I went through. I remember going through it and thinking, mm. oh, my, I'm tougher than this. I would never go. I'm not the person to be good to go through burnout now because I do what I do. I'm I'm aware that I went through burnout and I, you know, it happens. It happens. So I share my story. And it's what people really respond to because yeah. just giving other people permission, permission yeah. to talk about things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good for you. I mean, that's a, a, a generous act and for you to do, but as you say, it's sort of so valuable. There are so many sort of un, unspeakable things in, in, well, in women and men's we lives think too. They're, we think they're unspeakable. But actually, yes. more yes. of us experience these things. It's just we're not yes. necessarily feel comfortable talking about it. So the more people that can talk about their experiences and yes. show that it's okay. Um, anyway, that's how I feel about it. No, I'm with you. <laughs> um, I'm conscious of our time. I really sure. appreciate all oh. of your um, all of your chat, our conversation. Oh, sure. um, if people do want to find you, since you're not oh. on any of those other platforms <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah um well I'm, I'm on instagram so um there is that i'd only share sort of books actually but i have my own website so that's my name juliabueno.co.uk um and that's you should have find details of the two books i've read which are all good bookshops yeah um, we will put your link to your website in the show notes we'll also put a link to the books as well um everyone's everyone's a critic everyone's a critic yes <laughs> um, I guess just you know what if just the final final question is you know if someone if someone is really feeling like I really need some help with this what mm. is that what's their you know if, how do they and they're not in the UK or whatever how mm. could they what how could they find the right person to talk to as a therapist yeah yeah oh gosh that that's sometimes the scary bit of like, where do I go? Uh, that's a minefield. Um, oh, I've gosh. just been talking about it this morning. But I mean, <laughs> in the UK, and I can only speak for the UK because I, I don't know of other countries, but um, there are kind of professional organisations that I would always go for. OK, back up a bit. In the UK, psychotherapy is not regulated by statute. Um and but there's the the next best thing is that the there is a regulatory authority called the professional standards authority that have rubber stamped some professional organizations mainly two ukcp bacp which means that every single therapist who are are um, accredited or by them have done a you know a proper sound robust training they keep up their cpd and there's also a complaints procedure in the event of them being uh, unprofessional it's really important to get because it is perfectly legal if i get struck off today i could set up tomorrow oh wow okay. saying i'm a psychotherapist but i would just wouldn't be able to say i'm ukcp registered okay um, so look for those specific look for the professional registration rubber stamping um okay. and having said that just backing up if somebody is recognizes those i i think and i i think um the literature of Paul Gilbert, who's uh, or or Kristin Neff, I would recommend them just to get going with, start their books. Yeah. Um, I've I've had people come to me clutching one of those and said, you know, that's got me going. But um, but you might well need the help of a therapist or counsellor, as I say, if you do need to process um, some more kind of sticky stuff or or indeed traumatic stuff that has contributed because self criticism taken to to the extreme obviously you know i'm sure you can imagine can cause really grave mental illness yeah. so um doing that alone might not be advisable yeah okay well thank you julia not at all it's lovely i could Such natter all day <laughs> a pleasure to talk to you and i know that our listeners will also get a huge benefit out oh, of this conversation so well, thank you there's hope thank you so much <laughs>